any practice, let me know when you're ready to begin. I'm ready. Let's go for it. All right. You have a 73-year-old male that presents to the emergency room after being found down by his wife at his apartment, at their apartment. On arrival, he is awake and alert without signs of trauma. He reports about a four months of increasing worsening fatigue. He has also noticed a 20-pound weight loss over the past four months. He denies changes in his bowel habits. He does admit to occasional dark stools. No family history of colorectal cancer. He has never had a colonoscopy. He did have an appendectomy at 10 years old. Physical exam reveals a febrile, pulse rate 110, respiratory rate of 14. He is somewhat pale and a little bit weak appearing. His abdomen is non-distended, and he has a previous right lower quadrant appendectomy scar. Rectal exam is negative. He is admitted to the medical service, but they consult you for your workup. What's your differential? Differential at this point uh, include, um, you know, severe, a lower GI bleed um, from online malignancy, um, you know, diabetic uh, disease, um, or potentially some form of, um, you know, uh, interactive trauma. Okay. How would you like to proceed with your workup? Uh, so this is a gentleman. He appears from his vitals. He's hemodynamically stable. Um, I'm going to proceed. I have all the history that I need. I'm going to proceed and perform a focus exam, um, uh, particularly uh, in a rectal exam. So I'll do a digital rectal exam, endoscopy, uh, trying to identify, you know, see where I can find any uh, palpate, any masses. Negative. Okay. Um, so I will ensure that he has uh, large bore IVs uh, in place. I will start resuscitation. Um, I will set up um, uh, a typing screen, uh, CBC, and a CMP level. Okay, your CBC shows a hemoglobin of 7.1. Your BMP is normal. He also has some other labs that were drawn, including an albumin of three and a CEA of 6.5. Okay, uh, so I suspect that this is um, probably malignant um, cause of this lower GI, GI bleeding. Um, so I will proceed with, um, I'll start uh, uh, transfusion. I'll give him one uh, pack cells um, and then I will uh, admit him to the ICU. Um, and then uh, start is the uh, uh, prep, step prepping, prepping for colonoscopy. Okay, so he stabilizes uh, a little bit more after that unit of red blood cells and some fluid, and you prep him for a colonoscopy. Um, do you do that the next day? Is that okay, or do you want to do it right right away? I will do it the next day. Um, again, most important thing at this point is uh, making sure that you know he's hemodynamically stable. Uh, okay. Gotcha. So you do a colonoscopy and you find a ulcerated mass in the cecum that's measured about four, four centimeters. It's quite friable. Um, and you go ahead and you take some biopsies of that. Biopsy is going to take a couple of days to come back. All right. Um, so based on the endoscopic findings, this is highly suspicious of underlying malignancy. Um, I will have um, a conversation uh, with the family and the patient. Um, I will counsel them uh, that uh, he is going to require a... Um, uh, a, he's going to require surgery for this, and this will typically be a, a right hemicolectomy. Um, I'll counsel him on the risk and the benefit of the operation. Um, I will not wait for um, uh, for the final pathology. Uh, certainly, you know he's going to get. I'm um, going to get a, um, a you know proceed with you know staging prior to my operation. So I'll get a CT of the chest, um, abdomen, and pelvis. But again, in the meantime, preparing the patient for an operation. Um, if he needs medical optimization, uh, get an EKG, um, and then you know get any medical consultation that needs to be you know to help optimize him. Okay, so your CT scan does show a thickening and a possibility of mass in the cecum. There is no evidence of liver metastases. There are some enlarged lymph nodes in the mesentery. Um, there's a little bit of uh, difficulty seeing a plane between the psoas muscle and the posterior wall of the cecum. Meanwhile, the next day, your pathology also comes back as adenocarcinoma. Uh, so uh, given the size of the mass and the fact that there's concerns about retroperitoneal invasion, um, that uh, will change my uh, surgical approach, um, considering, considering that a patient is medically optimized at this point. I will proceed with an open right hemicolectomy. Okay, so we're in the operating room and your belly's open, your retractors are in, and take me through what you would do. All right, 
Uh, so um, in a media, in a lateral to medial fashion, I'm going to, um, first of all, once, once I get into the abdomen, I'll explore the abdomen for any signs of distal, distal metastasis, particularly in the liver. Um, and then I will uh, mobilize the cecum and a semicolon in a lateral to medial fashion. Um, I will perform a high ligation of, um, um, of the uh, elocolic pedicle uh, and perform a wide lymphadenectomy. Uh, in the retroperitoneal area, if there's any signs of invasion into um, the, you know, the psoas muscle or lateral abdominal wall, um, I'm going to resect this and block. Uh, certainly, um, I'm going to assess uh, the ureter and being very careful of paying attention in this area to avoid any injury in, um, of, what, of any sort. Um, okay. If there's any invasion of the lateral abdominal wall, I'll, I'll place some clips um, you know, to guide uh, subsequent adjuvant uh, therapy. And I'll perform, uh, considering that the patient is hemodynamically stable, I'll perform a, an ecocolic uh, anastomosis. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go back. Let's say during your initial um, CT scan, not only did you find the mass in the cecum, but you also found a small uh, three centimeter mass in the right lobe of the liver um, at the same time. Did that change your operative management? Um, so this would be a stage, a stage four disease, um, considering that, you know, that lesion in the right, le right lobe is uh, malignant. Um, uh, this patient presents with bleeding from this sequel mass with a, you know, a critical hemoglobin level that's requiring transfusion. Um, so it will not typically change, it will not change my immediate uh, surgical approach. I'll still proceed with uh, resection um, of the, I'll still proceed with uh, right hemicolectomy uh, to control the bleeding, uh, and get a biopsy of that liver mass, um, knowing that the patient will subsequently require a, you know, chemotherapy um, post in a post-operative setting. Okay. So let's, uh, let's um, move the lesion a little bit. Let's say, uh, according to the uh, colonoscopy note by GI, that it was in the mid-transverse colon, uh, and they said they tattooed it, but you can't see it or feel it. And you're laparoscopic at this point. Okay. Um, so I will, um, so I, 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 if I'm doing laparoscopic, I'll place a hand port and, you know, uh, see what I can actually fill it, you know, with, with pap, by, by patient. Okay. Anything else you could do? Um, I'll perform an intraoperative colonoscopy, um, you know, with CO2. Um, sometimes that can make, you know, the laparoscopic approach a little more difficult. Uh, but if I'm still, if it's, uh, after doing the colonoscopy with distension of the of the bowel, if the laparoscopic approach is more difficult, I will convert to an open operation. Okay. And what if you don't have access to colonoscopy for for whatever reason, uh, and you resected the area that you think you've got it out? How can you be sure before leaving the room? Oh, I would I open the specimen in the room to make sure that I actually get it, um, the lesion of concern. Okay. So uh, let's say um, you were in the operating room and um, uh, not only was this a uh, mass of the ascending colon, but it also involved the second portion of the duodenum. So if there's involvement in the second portion of the duodenum, uh, uh, I, at this point, I'm going to scrub out, I will uh, you know, discuss with the family um, about the new findings, um, I'm going to call for backup at this point, get my, you know, HPV uh, surgeon or one of my senior partners to come in and help me. But typically this will involve, um, you know, resection of that, of, you know, doing the extended right hemicolectomy um, and tough, tough trick, decision, huh? To be an unblocked resection with a Whipple's, which putting this 70, 80 year old gentleman through this operation is going to be a morbid um, considering you know, his age and comorbidities. Um, so I will proceed with um, the right hemicolectomy, um, ileostomy and mucous fistula uh, and, and a gastric you know, G tube uh, just for decompression um, and then potentially refer him to a tertiary center. After that. Okay, let's say you were laparoscopic before you had just started to explore laparoscopically and hadn't 
hadn't resected any pedicles yet. Could you back out? At this point, I will, I will, I'll bail out. Um, you know, he's not obstructed from this. I will, I will bail out and, um, you know, refer him to tertiary center. Okay. All right. So let's stop there with this one. So this one is, uh, what starts out to be a fairly straightforward sequel cancer and then has various, um, difficulties, of course. I think you did a good job dealing with the retroperitoneal um, invasion and especially with the clips and resecting end block and paying attention to the ureter, abdominal wall, whatever needs to be done. Sometimes these right colon cancers can get pretty extensive before they are discovered, um, because, before they become symptomatic in patients that have never had colonoscopy. So this is one of those situations. Yeah, with the duodenal invasion, that one's a tough one um, because a lot of times you might not suspect it, beforehand, or you might be resecting your, uh, doing your high ligation first, and then realize as you're trying to dissect the duodenum away from the uh, mesentery that there's invasion, um, so on and so forth. So um, if the, clearly if this is one that you can anticipate it beforehand, an EGD, uh, uh, MRCP, whatever other workup you need um, to confirm that, and then getting um, someone involved to help you with a partial du duodenectomy or Whipple, um, for some of these that are very extensive, might even consider doing um, neoadjuvant therapy, either chemo or radiation, um, to try to shrink it away from potential uh, IBC invasion or duodenal invasion or, or whatever, depending on your patient situation. So, yeah. all right, next one. Give me one second here. So, is it's the answer to just bail out, or actually, if I were to do a resection, do I commit to a Whipple's at this point? There's no right answer, man. That's why these are, that's why these are the board questions. There's no, uh, you know, it, it really depends on the situation. I mean, at some point, if you've already committed, you don't want to, you, I think the, the, you don't want to leave a positive margin, you know, if it's safe. I mean, if you feel comfortable doing a very small limited duodenal resection, then surely that's the way to go. But if you don't have that kind of backup or you, or you think that the patient's going to need a Whipple, um, that's not a, you know, that's a conversation you want to have before you commit. So um, it's a tough one. Yeah. All right. You have a 65-year-old woman who presents with complaints of fecal incontinence for several months duration. She reports three to four accidents per day with associated urgency. She's quite distressed about her problems as she's effectively tied to her house and has curtailed all of her social and recreational activities. Um, your history reveals that her stool is fairly uh, frequently loose and occasional diarrhea. The symptoms are, of course, worse with diarrhea. She feels that her rectum does completely evacuate after bowel movements. She has no history of anal trauma or surgery. She did have one spontaneous vaginal delivery 30 years ago with no episiotomy. Um, she does. She has no his, uh, other medical history. Uh, on exam, she appears in no acute distress. Perineal exam shows a thin perineal body, otherwise unremarkable. Digital rectal shows diminished resting. Sque uh, excuse me, diminished resting tone. Uh, and with squeeze, it uh, requires use of accessory muscles. With strain, there's questionable mucosal prolapse and a small to moderate anterior rectocele and no other masses or fistula noted on anoscopy. What's your differential at this point? Um, this one, uh, this differential include uh, for fecal incontinence. Um, this would be, you know, in a patient with, um, you know, sphincter uh, injury um, in the past, uh, considering that, you know, perineal body is very, appears very thin. Um, other things will be from, you know, rectal prolapse, partial rectal prolapse into susception, um, hemorrhoids, proctitis, um, or any other leading, uh, you know, it called rectal mass. Okay. Uh, how would you like to proceed at this point? So I will, um, you know, I have all the history and physical I need at this point. So I will proceed with, you know, further investigation, and this will include uh, in my institution, I typically do a colon upfront colonoscopy and uh, anal ultrasound uh, to evaluate for, you know, the sphincter anatomy. Okay, so colonoscopy is negative for any masses or uh, significant polyps. Um, so you said you wanted to get an endoanal ultrasound? Yes. And what are you looking for specifically? I'm looking for any defects in the, um, you know, in the internal or external sphincter, um, you know, the size of the perineal, uh, sorry, recto, uh, rectovaginal septum and the length of the perineal body. Okay, so they do report a decreased perineal body length 
in a, about a 80 to 90 degree, 90 degree anterior to 